I was having issues with my phone. And, and there's no one here going to like throw signs at me, right? There's no, OK. That freaked me out bad the first time I spoke. So hi, it's working. Um, this is me. Um, I have lots of cats, so I kind of like include them in all my slides. Uh, I am a lot of things. Um, the trendy name for that is being a polymath. So I learned that and I kind of throw it around. Uh, but all the things I do basically have to do with design, strategy, and creativity. Um, I'm a communicator and I'm also a mindfulness pr practitioner, which is why, if the clicker allows me, uh, I am talking to you about mindfulness in design. So we're going to talk about three things basically in this talk. The first one I'm going to tell you a little bit about what is mindfulness, um, a little bit how I came uh, across mindfulness and how I learned about it and my relationship and how it has helped me uh, personally and professionally. I'm going to describe you the principles of, ma on, of mindfulness practice and uh, some are going to resonate with a lot of the things you heard today and some you're going to hear tomorrow. And I'm finally going to show you how the principles of mindfulness can be applied to the practice of design um, so that our work can be more meaningful, inclusive, and valuable. I first, I first wrote this talk a few months ago. This is the first time I'm giving it sort of like in the full version. Uh, so bear with me if you know, I'm not super uh, perfect with it. Um, since uh, when I started thinking about mindful design, which is less than a year ago, um, I've been observing, and I'm very happy about this, that um, these topics, the topics of humanness, are increasingly, increasingly being more and more talked about and confronted, um, especially in the tech community. And, um, they're becoming hot topics, even though I tend to resent hot topics. Um, the fact that we are rediscovering and addressing a need for humanity, from mental health to compassion to happiness, and for philosophical issues like values and ethics and meaning, uh, it's feeding my hopes for a better and more valuable future. Because as designers, developers, and generally digital makers, we are called upon shaping the experiences and the interactions and the tools of tomorrow. So we do kind of have a responsibility. So uh, I want to express gratitude for two things. The first is the organizer's choice of allowing this tech conf to be more a human conf and address issues that are important. And I want to thank many brave humans, like Sasha this morning, who are working to make this conversation public, open and accessible. And this is not always easy. Um, it may get emotional, it may get, it's hard. It's hard, it takes courage to you know, get naked in front of people, um, even though one understands the importance of it. So, you know, let's all appreciate that. Um, it's only when we see things that we can do things about it. Uh, and so talking about the important things, talking about issues, keeping conversations open is the way to make change. But there'll be more about this later. So for now, a little bit about you. Um, show me hands. Uh, how many of you have heard the term mindfulness? OK. I know it's a trendy word. <laughs> how many of you know what mindfulness is? OK. Uh, how many of you practice mindfulness? OK. That's good. That's good. Uh, good. So mindfulness is a pretty straightforward word. 
it suggests that the mind is fully attending at what, to what's happening, to what you're doing and feeling, to the space you're moving through. And though this may seem trivial, it's quite difficult, especially for untrained minds, uh, because thoughts you know, take us over. We start thinking, and we can't stop thinking. That's quite difficult. Um, and it's very easy to go give in to emotions and be just overwhelmed by emotions. So we end up losing touch with reality. We become engrossed in obsessive thinking. Uh, an anxiety takes over, and stress eats all our energy. And just for clarity, mindful has nothing to do with religion nor spirituality, really, uh, though praying is one of many forms of mindfulness practice. So a few things you should know about mindfulness, for those of you who don't know it. <laughs> um, it is not obscure or exotic. It's, it's, famili it's familiar because it's something that it's innately in all of us. We just are not aware because we don't use it. Um, it takes many shapes and it goes by many names from meditating, to praying, to focusing. Athletes know mindfulness because that's what they need to perform. They need to be able to focus and um, move in a very specific sense and turn their minds off. And it's not a special extra thing we can do, you know, to make our lives better. Um, we already have the capacity to be present. Um, it doesn't require any change in us, um, but we don't really know how to do it. So we need to cultivate these qualities. Um, practicing mindfulness makes us better people, nicer people to be around, um, less anxious people, less nasty people. <laughs> it really does. Um, you don't need to change. Um, solutions that ask us to change um, or to turn ourselves into something we're not don't work because we are what we are. Uh, mindfulness recognizes us that we are what we are and we can cultivate what, who we are to sort of make the good things in us better, not change us into something we are not also because it doesn't work. You, you eventually, um, you know, always return to your nature. Mindfulness has the potential to become a transformative social phenomenon. And here's why. Anyone can do it. Uh, mindfulness practice uh, cultivates universal human qualities. Uh, it doesn't require to change your belief. As I said, it's not a religious practice. Everyone can benefit, uh, and it's easy to learn, and it's free. It's a way of living, and it's a way of working, and it's a way to approaching life. Um, it brings awareness and, care, and uh, caring into everything we do, and it helps us cut down stress. And it does. It makes our lives better. Um, it's based on evidence. Uh, we don't have to believe in mindfulness. Uh, both science and experience demonstrate its positive benefits. Uh, if you know someone that practices mindfulness, or, or those of you who do, uh, know that it actually works. It actually uh, transforms you um, in subtle but very intense ways. And it makes us healthier, happier, um, better at work, and better at relationships. It sparks innovation. Um, as we deal with a world that is increasingly complex um, and uncertain and anxiety-causing, um, learning to manage that anxiety and become more resilient and less open to be, you know, pushed and, and thrown off balance by things 
um, helps us. And this is also the reason why I'm talking about applying these principles to the practice of design. So let me show you something, and please raise your hands to give me feedback. Who's familiar with any of these feelings? Anger, anxiety, fear, frustration, panic, stress, rage. Happen to someone sometimes, every once in a while? Yeah. <laughs> I call it the unleashed monster or the dragon when it happens to me, because it still happens to me. Um, and it happens. How often? What are the consequences? How many of us have done or said something really stupid or really hurtful or really bad and regretted it and wished that we had just a little more cold blood to, you know, stop right before saying it or doing it. What about these feelings? Is it familiar? There's a name for it. It's called mental rumination, and it's a killer. I suffered from this, like, terribly and extensively. It refers to the tendency to repeatedly think about the causes the situational factors and the consequences of one's negative emotional experience. I used to have conversations with myself, and like, you know, out loud. So, you know. Basically, rumination means that you continuously think about the various aspects of a situation that are upsetting. And I'm sure you know someone like this. I do. I was a professional warrior for about 45 of my 52 years, and I don't consider the first five because I wasn't old enough, you know. So this dude, I could beat him anytime. And basically, the result was this. I was constantly, physically, mentally, and emotionally exhausted, except I wasn't this cute. <laughs> it was more like this. Um, so, battling with depression and anxiety and paralyzing fear and panic attacks while being self-employed and a sole provider, so with like actual factual consequences, I realized that I needed something. I needed help, but from within. I wanted to overcome this, not to put a patch on it, to solve it. Basically, I wanted this, you know, but I felt it was unachievable because my mind wouldn't just shut up and I just thought I was doing it all wrong, you know, and I guess, like everyone, I thought, well, I'm going to sit here and be quiet and somehow it's going to happen and it just doesn't work that way. So I thought meditation was a superpower that was unreachable but to a few enlightened people. So my instinct, which is something that I've always managed to cultivate, and it's something that I invite you to learn to listen to, because they have a huge value, um, they pointed me to something. And I started coloring. I found one day you know, a coloring book, and I said, mm, you know, it says for adults. And it didn't have any like naked pictures in it, so mm. uh, so I said, okay, let's start doing this, you know. And I started doing it, and coloring was shutting my mind up. When I was coloring, the bzz, 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 you know the conversation with my multiple personalities would just shut up. So I was like, wow, I'm on to something here. So. I also realized that there were activities that, that, that it wasn't coloring per se, that if I concentrated on something apparently mindless, I could um, shut up the brain. So there was a mechanism. 
instinctively, uh, I'm sure there's some of you that, I don't know, so I know women that when they're very stressed, they clean, because when they clean, they concentrate on cleaning. Um, I know people that run. I know people that do other things. That's mindful. You just don't call it that. So I was like, well, this coloring thing is really awesome. So I decided I you know, was going to make some coloring books, and I did. And I was doing research on coloring books, and I started reading about this you know, mindfulness thing. So, oh, what is that? It's, so, you know, so what is this? It's considered a quality of the mind, as I was saying before, so it's hard to define it. I like to give this definition. It's a state of full awareness or intentional presence. But the official overall definition is that it's a basic human, human ability to be fully present, of, aware of where we are and what we're doing, and not overly reactive or overwhelmed by what's going on around us. The term mindfulness also refers to the cultivation of this basic human ability through various methods that include meditation, mindful movement, mindful eating, coloring, and there's many more. In all of them, intention is the key. We call this mindfulness practice to distinguish it from the basic ability that we all have. So mindfulness can be considered a state of intentional awareness achieved by focusing our attention on the present moment or present activity. The goal is to remain in the here and now, not in the past where there is regret because unfortunately there is no cure for past experiences. The only thing we can do is learn from them, but dwelling on the past serves no, has no value, serves no purpose. And not in the future, because in the future we worry and we become anxious. We obviously plan and dream for and about the future, but we can't control the outcomes. So being anxious about the future is normal, but an excess of anxiety, it's paralyzing. But we'll talk about that a little later. In the present moment, there are no reaction, nor events, nor there's judgment. It's only observation. So try to be present here and now. Try and breathe with intention and follow your, your breath as you inspire and expire. That sounds terrible. Focus on it. Feel the seat behind your butt. Do you, do you feel the wooden, you know, the hardness, the sensation? Okay, we're not, we, we're not used to, but it's there. It's just something that we don't pay attention to. Um, feel the floor beneath your feet. Wiggle your toes in your shoes. Feel yourselves here. Notice the temperature, the light, the sensations. Try and breathe again. Try and smile with purpose. While you're doing this, you're not ruminating. You're not worrying. You're not feeling anxiety because it's kind of like your mind cannot do too many things at a time. So if it's intentionally breathing, it's not worrying. If it's feeling the floor, it's not worrying. In other terms, mindfulness help us not freak out, which in itself, it's a pretty cool thing. You know, I mean, I could stop right here as far as I'm concerned. It helps us manage mental rumination. For many of us, it helps us keep the imposter under control when that little nasty voice comes up, we can talk to it. We can see it and say, you're the imposter, shut up. It helps us manage anxiety. And it can help us 
learn to gain and, con and maintain control in this stressful situation so we don't do the bad things that I was referring to before. It kind of helps sort things out. It smooths out the thoughts. It untangles thoughts and emotions. And again, I don't know about you, but I mean, this thing flipped my life, and I'm, I'm very serious about it. Um, this, gentleman, this gentleman is John Kabat-Zinn. He's an American professor. And in 1979, he started doing research about this. And since, th since then, a lot of research has been compiled. Uh, he is the founder of the Stress Reduction Clinic, Clinic and the Center of Mindfulness in Medicine, Healthcare, and Society at the University of Massachusetts. And he's generally recognized as the father of what we currently define mindfulness and mindfulness practice. In his words, mindfulness is awareness that arises through paying attention on purpose to the present moment, non-judgmentally. It's basically knowing what's going on in our mind. So in my experience, these are the benefits of mindfulness practice. This is what I got out of it. I stopped ruminating, and so I got less tired and stressed. I went from this to this, which is a lovely place to be. Um, it has helped me build resilience and it has given me clarity to confront with, you know, a real issue like mortgage or bills, you know, that, that kind of thing. Um, I learned to pay focused attention at the moment I'm living, like I'm here. Like sometimes I see beautiful scenery and I resist getting my camera out and taking a picture of it. I just say, it's beautiful. I'm just going to like enjoy the fact that it's beautiful and that I'm here, able to enjoy it. So being the here and the now, it's a skill we've lost, and one that all the information that gets thrown at us um, hinders all the time. I learned to let go, which was not easy. Um, Control is pacifying until it becomes highly stressful, or better. Control is pacifying when we learn to control ourselves. Generally, though, we try and control people and situations, and they tend not to like that. So they don't cooperate, and that's very, very distressful. I learned to create a mental condition of peace and harmony, not 24-7, you know, every day, but I... Uh, and this, again, helps me be clear and focused when I need to and not give in to panic. Because it's hard to make decisions and know where to go when you're battling with fear, you know, and, and when you... and panic blocks us. I mean, not us as humans, it blocks every sentient being. You know, animals get hit by cars because they freeze. You know, when it's, it's, an, it's an instinctual reaction. So the ability to stop and regain balance, it's a huge value. I also learned that thoughts are not reality. And this helps me regain control when I lose it. If we are unaware of the difference between what we think and what is real, managing our emotion can become incredibly difficult. What makes a thought feel real is the attention we bring to it. If all of us, if we start thinking that our neighbor hates us and wants to kill us, and we just give this thought food, and we, you know, go at it and go at it, um, it's going to become real, and it's, you know, a disease when it becomes real in this case. But even thoughts not that 
extreme, uh, you know, they only exist if we, because this all happens in our head. Very often our neighbor could not care less unless we bothered them, you know, for some reason. So when we focus on it, we turn thoughts into solid objects. Being aware of this, you know, can save us a lot of money in psychiatry treatment and drugs. <clears throat> It has also opened me up to synchronicity, which is also the song by the police, but it's not what I'm referring to. It means that the quiet inside and not being scared and anxious allows me for my instinctual antennas. And so I um, feel things, I get vibes. I'm able to you know, meet the right people not because I'm lucky, but because I'm paying attention to that and I'm not worried about something else. So in a conversation, I can go, oh, wow, this is really interesting. While if I'm worried about something else, I'm not even going to see that person. And there's missed opportunities. So to me, synchronicity is the universe saying, yes. Bullshit, possibly. But it makes me happy. It, you know, other people have faith in God. So their version is, you know, I'm doing what God wants for me. I mean, some people think it's fate. Some people think it's luck. It doesn't matter what you call it, really. So practicing mindfulness has helped me through the most difficult time of my life. And I can honestly, honestly say it has saved my life. Um, it helped me to get my pieces back together. Um, it also helped me to choose which pieces to keep, which pieces were not serving me. And also it helped me put some pieces in different places from where they were because they work better and they serve me better. But I know you're like, yeah, lovely. So, but where's the design part of it? It's coming. First of all, like mindfulness, design is a practice. This means it's an activity that finds its value in its application. Design is a process, it's not the outcome. The principles and the values behind the practice of mindfulness applied to the design practice can help us create better and more meaningful work. Let me show you what I mean. Presence and awareness are the two basic conditions in which to operate. They're not principles, they're just kind of requirements. We tend to work and live on autopilot very often. We just do, we go through the motions of things. Um, mindfulness helps us regain control and stop being on autopilot. When we design on autopilot, the results are partial incomplete, lacking originality, lacking innovation. You know, it, you're just going through the motion. Your heart, your head, your energy is not really in it. Going through the motion of design is not design. Compassion and gratitude are the basic values behind mindfulness. When we design with compassion and gratitude, our products are inherently accessible, meaningful, usable, and valuable. So here are the seven pillars of mindfulness practice and some, and some tips on how you can apply it to, the, to your design practice. The first is being non-judgmental. Judgments tend to dominate our minds and make it hard for us to find peace. Suspending judgment, not only towards others, but mostly towards ourselves, allows us a more neutral and open approach, one that welcomes creativity and innovation. When we are non judgmental, we don't elaborate on our experiences, we simply leave them as they are, observing them and letting them go if they're not serving us a good purpose. In design, this translates in higher listening capacity. 
and a more open mind. It allows for solutions that are innovative, inclusive, and creative, and meaningful. When we listen mindfully, and we curb the inner and outer critic, we allow ideas to flow freely. The second principle is patience. To be patient, this was so hard for me, um, is to be completely in every moment accepting it in its fullness, even the bad moments. Um, to keep bringing the mind back to the breath, to the wiggling of the toes, it requires a lot of patience and perseverance, but it's the working ground of a meditation practice. We need to, not to be patient, we need to be patient, not only with ourselves, with others, but mostly with ourselves. Hurry and impatience take us away from the here and now. They breed anxiety and intolerance. In design, hurry is amongst quality's worst enemies. When hurried, thoughts are unclear, processes is muddled, solutions arranged haphazardly just to get something done. Intolerance inhibits inclusion and produces results that are myopic, limited, and mediocre. Intolerance cultivates our bias and turns us into deaf executors. Impatience makes our design anxious, insensible. Quality takes time, but quality time, not a lot of time. If we have one day to do something, then it's fine. We're going to do whatever we have to do is one day, in, in one day. But if that one day it's mindful, then it's one day of valuable time, which is worth a lot more than two weeks of thinking about something else time. A patient and open approach is a loving approach. And that's inevitable for any work to be inclusive, balanced, and valuable. A user experience that is rooted in patience and in compassion will inevitably be a better one. Man maintaining a beginner's mind. Um, approaching e each process as if it were the first time building from the ground up, asking ourselves what's really happening now, these are all hallmarks of a beginner's mind. In design, keeping a beginner's mind allows us to remain open to new and different approaches, opinions and methods. It reduces expectations and bias. Trusting on ourselves, it's the fourth pillar. Learning to trust our experience our feelings, our intuition, loosening ourselves from the tyranny of inner harsh judgment and the way things are done has a taste of freedom. And it's a key hallmark for a genuine practice. And it's essential for individual development. When we design, we must trust ourselves. It is in this trust in our knowledge, in our competence, in our talent, in our intuition, that we can produce innovation. We need to have faith in ourselves, in our competence. If we do, we have the strength to push the boundaries and break the rules. But if we are afraid, because what are people gonna think? It's never been, it's always been done this way. You don't do new things if you always do things the way they're being done. Non-striving, another very difficult thing. Um, almost everything we do, we do for a purpose. To get something or to get somewhere. Um, in meditation, this attitude, it's a real obstacle. The attitude of non-striving is best understood 
as not straining or forcing a result. This can be challenging and liberating. It's not easy at all. It, it goes against everything we've been thought, taught. Sorry. Non-doing, non-pushing, non-manipulating, and forcing event to get what we want is very hard. Even silence is very hard for a lot of people. It implies letting go of control and opening up to inspiration in the literal sense of letting things in and breathing them out, just like air. When practicing design, not pushing the final result in the direction we want allows us to avoid limiting ourselves. It allows for inspiration and creativity. And it allows us to get somewhere else. Um, if there's an agenda behind our work, it will skew results. If we're doing this, but we're actually trying to make that the outcome, it will likely result in feeling manipulative and dishonest. Okay, this is a huge one. Very hard. Very, extremely hard, but... Um, you have to accept yourself as you are before you can really change. Acceptance is about attending to one's experience with clarity and kindness. Sometimes things don't go as we'd like. Sometimes we fail. Sometimes we make mistakes and sometimes bad mistakes. We are a work in progress. We can only do our best with the best and most honest intentions. So accepting our limits and the limits that surround us is vital for growth and for health and for mental health. As designers, a kind awareness and a gentle acceptance of our limits are keys to see ourselves and the work we do with clarity. This can foster our growth and the project's quality. But not only that, it is our uniqueness with all its limits that harbors our creativity and that fosters our ability to find new solutions. It's our limits, it's our frailties, it's our weaknesses that make us more valuable. It kind of gives a different meaning to, you know, they're not defaults anymore, they're not defects, you know, they're cool things. It's a, sh it's a switch in perspective, but it makes, at least me, it made me feel a lot better. And accepting others, it's the root for our sense of ethics and for justice, and for meaning, and goodness, which is something we sorely need to revamp in our entire industry, and in general, in the world. The last one is letting go. Not easy. Learning to let go, or as it's said in the practice, to be non-attached, is fundamental. The tendency to want to hold on to what is pleasant in our experience and to reject what is unpleasant, it's usually an automatic response, sometimes known as being on autopilot. This is good, I like it, I want to keep it. This is bad, I don't, you know, I don't want to feel pain. I don't want to feel hurt. I don't want to feel any discomfort. It's instinctive, it's childish, that's what children do. Um, it prevents us from growing up. Letting go, it's hard. And yet, of all things, learning to let go opens the door to transformation. You can't go anywhere if you don't leave where you are. You can't grow if you are unwilling to leave parts of you behind and make room for new parts. 
So what's letting go in design? Reducing expectations on us, on others, on results, on performance, on people's opinions and judgment. Letting go leaves us room for inspiration, for casualty, for the unknown in the design process. Letting go also means our lack of control on external elements. Things are going to happen. And if they happen, you can do two things. You can freak out bad, or you can make the most of it. The version where it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. You know? So it's kind of like, it's raining, but I wanted to go for a picnic. But it's raining. It ain't going to stop raining because you, you, know, you had planned a picnic. So. If we accept things, if we accept that we don't have control over things, we have more free mind to think up alternatives. I really wanted to do a picnic, and I was hoping for the sun, but it, it's raining, but I was, you know, I, I didn't freak out, so I thought, well, we can go have a picnic under, you know, something that is preventing me from getting wet. But if we just get really angry and annoyed because it's raining, we're just going to have a bad day and no picnic. Turning obstacles in opportunity is something that is the biggest thing I can leave you with today. Learning to take whatever crap was thrown at you and decide that you're not going to let whoever threw crap at you uh, win because you're going to take that crap and you're going to make some great crap cake out of it. Um, it's, I mean, to me, it's the best vengeance you can you know, ever have. Um, practicing mindfulness is not difficult. It has no particular requirements. Uh, you just need an open mind and the wish to feel better, to feel more serene, to be less stressed. There are books, there are websites, there's apps. Uh, afterwards, if you want, I can tell you what I use. Um, it's, really, it's really easy. It's, I cannot find words to stress this enough. Um, in my experience, stopping rumination, making peace with my limits, accepting there are things outside of my control, and learning to manage anxiety, um, along with learning to be compassionate and grateful, uh, both toward myself and others, have made me a better designer, a better professional. They have added value and meaning to my daily activity. They've also kind of made me a nice person to be around, because I wasn't very, like, in the bad days, you wasn't very, like, yeah, I'll call you tomorrow, you know, kind of thing. So, I'm extremely grateful for having the opportunity to tell you about this today. Uh, I hope that for those of you who are not familiar, you are a little more curious about it, and maybe a little more inspired. In a lot of what I do, my aim is awareness, because we can only do something about the things we see and we perceive. So I hope that mindfulness can help you, as it has helped me. And I thank you. I'm four minutes late.